Escape felons on the loose, a pirate's treasure waiting to be found, and a gaggle of friendships we all wish we had when we were kids brought together to save their childhood home from a shady development deal. This is our two-year anniversary since we turned the projector off, and the 35th anniversary of this classic film. So sit back as we remake The Goonies. That's right, The Goonies, right. Hey, you guys! Hello, my fellow cinematic architects, and welcome back to Remake This Movie Right. Remake This Movie Right is a show that takes an original film that has an actual remake in the works. Kidding! It does not this time. Figure out what still clicks and what doesn't. There's a little bit of humor at it, and then we determine exactly how Hollywood should remake it. By the end of each episode, we will have the remake ready to roll for Hollywood execs and presented to you in movie trailer form, presented by Wayne Henderson of MediaVoiceOvers.com. We are here to tell Hollywood how to remake this movie right. I am your host, Aaron Peterson. Joining me today is my fellow host, Troy Heinrichs. So glad to be back doing this, especially for the Goonies, because this is a childhood, you know, dream come true. And to this day, I cannot believe they still have not created the Goonies, the theme park water slide. You won't wait. How would that work? Well, I guess, yeah, that could work. I could see that. That'd be fun. Ever since the, 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 when they slide down the water slide and get to the pirate ship, like that is the one thing I always wanted as a kid was to go to the theme park to do the Goonie water slide in a cave. Man, and and Warner Brothers owns Six Flags, right? Because they're all Looney Tune characters that are there, so or at least they have some stake in it. Just freaking yeah, let's let's do it. Let's get a Goonie ride. Why not? Or license it to Universal or something to do it into Islands of Adventure or, or Universal Florida has a new water park they're building, not anywhere near the current parks, which is totally weird. But that's for another podcast in a different day. Big fan. Or add it to, you know, Disney can buy it. And what they can do is they can connect that sucker to Pirates of the Caribbean or something. I don't know. They're, they're... I think that they're at the limit of IP purchases <laughs> before the SEC and the FCC and the FTC and a bunch of other acronyms get involved. I keep thinking that. I think they'll buy another net, uh, studio and a network and whatever else they can get their hands I on. I am literally waiting for the day that now that the Paramount thing is no longer a thing and not that Disney was ever subject to the Paramount thing. That, uh, yeah, we're going to see Disney and Apple and Netflix actually buy AMC, Cinemark, and Regal. It could happen. It could happen. But you know what? We're here to talk about the Goonies. And if you don't know what what the Goonies is, I mean, I'm going to tell you what the plot is, but if you don't know, I think your childhood is ashamed of you. I really, really do. Would you agree? There could be there could be some 10-year-old listeners, and then I'd be ashamed of the parents for not showing them their childhood yeah, memories. Yeah, that's really a parenting fail. If your kids haven't seen the Goonies, I mean, this, this movie helps them establish what it takes to build quality friendships because it's our time it's our time down here it's their time up there i just want to cry all right well mikey walsh and brandon walsh are brothers whose family is preparing to move because developers want to build a golf course and the place of their neighborhood unless not enough money is raised to stop the construction of that golf course and that's quite doubtful but when mikey stumbles upon a treasure map of the famed one-eyed willie's hidden fortune which is conveniently hidden right in Mikey's house. That's pretty handy. (laughs) Mikey, Brandon, and their friends, Lawrence, Chunk, Cohen, Clark, Mouth, Devereaux, Andrea, Andy, Carmichael, Stephanie, Steph, Steinbrenner, and Richard, Dada Wang, (laughs) set out on a quest to find the treasure in hopes of saving their neighborhood. But trying to beat them to it are criminals Mama Fratelli and her sons Jake Fratelli, Francis Fratelli, and the severely disfigured Lotney Sloth Fratelli. That's right. These are the Goonies. <sighs> I think this is the first time that I knew his name is Lotney. I didn't know it was until I wrote that. I'm like, that's that's his name, Lotney? I think this is the first time I knew her name was Stephanie, to be quite <laughs> honest. It's amazing. I was like, you know, the, the other one with the glasses. That's that I think likes mouth in the end, really. Now, do you remember seeing this? Did you see it in the theater? Or did you see it on home video? Where did you see this one at the first time? That's a really good question. This was after Back to the Future? Yes, this was. Yep. Then I think I saw this in the theater. No, no, back to actually, the f- e- same year, eighty-five, right? Same year. I think so. Yeah, because I know I saw ET was like my first movie in the theater, which my Ouch. parents will never li- li- live down because I screamed for days afterwards to bring ET back. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think I saw this in the theater, but I, I more remember watching it over and over and over again on video cassette because I had to pay a bunch of late fees to take the tape back. 
<laughs> that's a good that's a good sign, right? Back in the day, because that's what happened. Yeah, they were too expensive to actually go out and buy them. They made those things like a hundred bucks a pop. And then when it came out on on DVD, it was like, oh my gosh, the octopus got added in. I'm so excited. And then I wasn't really that excited. <laughs> yeah, it didn't work. It was. It did not. <laughs> no. Not at all. Worst special effect. I remember seeing this in the theater. I did see it in the theater. I remember seeing it in the theater. And yes, it was the same year as Back to the Future. 1985. That's like the the prime of my teenage years. I, wa- I was, well, actually, I wasn't even quite a teenager. I was almost a teenager. But I was like in the same age as these kids. So I wanted these these kinds of friends, you know, because I, I grew up in kind of a broken family and whatnot. You know, not I'm not trying to make it a sad story. So hang, t- hang tight. This isn't Dr. Phil. But for me, these these kids. There was a really bad man who was coming into his neighborhood and was going to tear <laughs> right. down the projects. And he had to like go find a treasure map down at the local library. I did. I grew up poor and I, and I grew up in the projects. And, I, and our friends were kind of like this. Like they were all from different elements, different families, different kinds of kids. And we all came together. And we were kind of like this family. So it, the movie felt like such a family. It really reminded me of most kids that I grew up with in the 80s. And, you know, had a lot of those kinds of of friendships where they were seen as, I mean, these kids were a lot softer than the people I grew up with, but they were seen as kind of rebels and and whatnot, and myself included. And here, here they were just kind of like tamer versions of those same kind of friendships. And it really, really spoke to me as a movie fan, as someone who uh, just, it kind of lived on imagination. I mean, I've always wanted to, you know, be a writer and things like that. So my imagination has always been sparked like these big ideas, these big crazy concepts and a, a pirate treasure hunt is like at the top of the list. Who doesn't want that? When you're a poor kid, the idea of I'll find, it's kind of like playing the lottery, right? I'll find a treasure map, find the treasure changes m- me and my family's entire life. Like that's a dream. Yeah. I mean, if there was a treasure map, I'd take it right now because I got to pay rent next month. <laughs> But as a kid, it's even better because you're poor. You're you're basically your your mom. No, you, you did it as a kid because check. you wanted to buy baseball cards to get that really crappy gum. I didn't. No, like, we were really really poor, man. I just wanted to eat like a steak <laughs> at some point because <laughs> I was getting a little tired of Vienna sausage in the can, and that those are oh god, they're horrible. Oh no, yeah, that's <sighs> I I really feel bad for you now. <laughs> that's like I worse than SpaghettiOs. Had man. A lot of that. A lot of to to this day, opening a can around me, and I will get. Sick, Ugh. but it, but it, it it totally screams childhood because I know like I would think this movie and probably partly Stand by Me in a lot of ways just felt like mm-hmm. that quintessential growing up. You know, your buddy is getting together to do some kind of crazy thing, and for us, we specifically had a, a little bit of like a forest preserve that was, um, I guess you know there was a little creek or creek depending on what part of the country you live in. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's some little crawfish in there and stuff. So we'd like go, you know, find the crawfish. Nothing like you'd find down south, like little baby ones. But we'd like, we'd spend all of our summers like building forts out in the forest and just finding new places to go. And then people would come by on the bike path and we'd all be like, blah, 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 and scare them on the bike path and stuff. <laughs> you know? Did you ever do like, snake wrangling where you'd, where you'd take a, pick a gardener snake oh, yeah, up on a stick and throw it at somebody? <laughs> not as much a stick, but we had the, um, what do you call it? It was the, uh, the claw grabber. Where you pull on the the trigger and it oh, makes yeah. the claw hand on the end. So we'd like we'd grab the grass snakes with the claw with the claw grabber. <laughs> I miss being a kid. Now everybody I mean, it, everything hurts you apparently, but man, snakes were fun to play with. And then you grew up and you watch Porky's and Fast Times at Ridge Mountain High and Back to the Future and you try to be cool. See, I always prefer but, these kinds of movies. I mean, because there aren't many of them. You know, you'd think something like The Goonies, which is uh, so timeless and a real classic and has stood the test of time, which, you know, we all love movies from different eras and stuff. But this is a movie that still holds up. And there aren't many of those where you watch it 35 years later and you're thinking, this doesn't look that that old. Like it really does. I think Back to the Future holds up like that, too. Oh, it absolutely does. And I think this is one of the fun ones because as you're, as you're kind of in that mikey age group you kind of think about like well who's like your first crush yeah like especially when it comes to women and i can remember watching lucas and going wow carrie green is kind of hot she's adorable and then when you're mikey and you're like and mikey gets to kiss carrie green in the cave you're like mikey's my hero i want to be mikey when i grow up mikey's awesome and then turns out sean Aston really is awesome because he literally was 
everything you want to be. Like he was a football player. Mm-hmm. He got to he got to save Middle Earth. And he's a great brother in this movie. Like, I I know we always talk about the kids, but he's really a great brother. Like, he's the brother you always wanted. For sure. Absolutely. You know, they obviously fight and whatnot, and they don't get along at times. But, man, when it comes down to it, they're both there for each other. And that's that's a beautiful thing. Even sharing girlfriends. (laughs) Well, not intentionally. I, I wonder how that would play in today's environment. But that was a that was a moment where. That could easily be a very uncomfortable scene, and I think it was played beautifully because it was so innocent. It came across very innocent and sweet, and it, it really, really, that's a beautiful scene, the whole kissing her. What happened to your braces, Aaron? <laughs> <laughs> Every boy fantasized about being Mikey, let me tell you. Cause, oh, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know what? Let's let's get into the actual original movie. We are a member of the Hollywood Outsider Network. Listen to episodes of Remake This Movie Right on your favorite podcast app, or just visit the website at RemakeThisMovieRight.com. Troy's been trying to bring this back for like a once a month event <laughs> for a long time. So you never know. If you really enjoy the show and you've missed it, you know, send us an email. Let us know or hit us up on our Facebook group or on Twitter at Remake Right and let us know that you, you really missed the show and you'd like it to come back. And you never know. Things can happen. Weird stuff has happened. So right now, let's take a listen to the Goonies. But the worst thing I ever done, I mixed up all this fake puke at home, and then I went to this movie theater, hid the puke in my jacket, climbed up to the balcony, and then then I made a noise like this. And then I dumped it over the side. I had all the people in the audience. Then, then this was horrible. All the people started getting sick and throwing up all over each other. I never felt so bad in my entire life. Mom, they're going to like this kid. All right, now we've always got some trivia about the movie. Are you ready for some Goonies trivia? There's got to be a ton of it by now, I would assume. Yes, and I'm making all of it up. None of the, No, it's all true, That I, as far as I know. So when rocks are falling from the cave ceiling, K. Hai Kwan screams, holy S-H-I-T. He said he spelled the expletive because his mother made him promise not to use any bad language in the movie. That's funny because he probably had one letter then for each boulder as he ran down the hallway to try to avoid the last one. <laughs> and I'm still mad. <laughs> I'm still mad we never got a short round movie, by the way. Still could. Still could. I think that would be great. What a spinoff. It'd be fun. Um, according to Sean Astin, he was allowed to keep the treasure map used in the film. Several years later, his mother, Patty Duke, discovered it, thought it was just a crinkled piece of paper, and threw it in the trash. Did Sean get it out of the trash? No, it's gone. I do understand. I don't know if he got it back. I actually, I don't know the end of that, but I'm going to assume no, oh, because man. it's a better story. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is heartbreaking. Isn't it? I'm almost, I'm almost tearing up a little bit. I like, would, that's, like, that's like a classic piece of movie history. I would want emancipation at that point. I'm like, you know I think what? So. I think we're done. I think so. <laughs> June 7th was officially declared Goonies Day by the mayor of Astoria, where the movie was filmed, during the 25th anniversary celebration in 2010, which is very cool. For our out of the United States listeners, that is Astoria, Oregon, one of the states on the West Coast by the Pacific. <laughs> Did you just say one of the, like they wouldn't know where Oregon was? Well, you know, they might not know where Oregon or Astoria and okay. All with right. everything happening in Portland right now, maybe people don't want to know where oh, Oregon is. Man. Ain't that true? Well, One-Eyed Willie's ship, the Inferno, was 105 feet long and took two and a half months to construct. It was modeled after Errol Flynn's ship in the Seahawk from 1940. I don't know if you guys ever saw that. Great great movie. The sails required more than 7,000 square feet of material. The largest measured 30 feet by 60 feet. And some of the ship's rigging was recycled for the Pirates of the Caribbean ship at Disneyland, which was being renovated at the time. Ah. I'm more impressed that the ship was called the Inferno because that's the first time I knew that too. <laughs> so I'm learning all kinds of new stuff tonight. Well, and also this educational is, and entertaining. Yeah, and this is kind of a, a fun fun fact, I guess. But if if you didn't know this, the the kids, you know, when they first see the pirate ship, they had they hadn't seen it to that point. Do, Richard Donner, the director, he kept it from them because he really wanted to surprise them. So a lot of those surprise shots were real surprise. So the, oh, wow, was actually really a, an, oh, wow. I don't moment. know if all of it was, but some of it was definitely very genuine. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would have been, I mean, it was like, I remember being a kid watching that reveal and just going like, there's a pirate ship in the movie. That's awesome. Yeah. I totally would have taken it for a spin if I was there. I'd be like, all right, let's go. Let's, 
Let's do this. Uh, the Goonies Oath. You ready? The Goonies Oath that was cut out. You want to know what it was? Sure. Other than it probably ends with Goonies Never Say Die? No. Or starts with Goonies Never Say Die? Neither. Does it exist anywhere in the oath at all? <laughs> no, it doesn't. It doesn't. But here we go. Here's the oath. I will never betray my goondock friends. <laughs> I swear it. I, I didn't make this up. We will stick together until the whole world ends. Through heaven and hell and nuclear war, good pals like us will stick like tar. That doesn't rhyme. Uh, in the city or the country or the forest or the boonies, I am proudly declared a fellow goonie. I feel like they should have made Stephanie and... So now I can I can only think of her as Carrie Green. <laughs> Andy. Andy. Uh, they should have made them do that in the well. I think that would have been a, a cool add-in. Would have been way better than the octopus. I don't know, but now that I'm reading that, I don't know if they needed to have it at all because it's not good. <laughs> it's, it's like... Through heaven and hell and nuclear war, good pals like us will stick like tar. War and tar don't rhyme. But it's an Oregon accent. Tar. Tar. <laughs> tar, I guess. <laughs> I don't understand. All right, well, whatever. More trivia. Come on, let's go. Cindy Lauper co-wrote the theme song. Goonies are good enough. You know what I find, you know what I find funny in that, that pledge is that the nuclear war does come up because it was the 80s and that was all the rage. So the fact that kids would be afraid of nuclear war is kind of actually interesting that they pen that in there to be part of the motto. All right. Well, Cindy Lauper co-wrote the theme song, Goonies Are Good Enough, and shot a music video that features a cameo by the film's executive producer, Steven Spielberg. The 12-minute video basically, basically, tells the movie's story as a musical. Cindy Lauper plays Cindy, a new Goonie recruit. The Bangles play Pirates. And Andre the Giant meets or plays Sloth. I just want to point out, I met Susanna Hoffs of the Bengals once. <gasps> she is gorgeous. I don't know why. I just want to throw this in there. <laughs> I met Andre the Giant once. Was he gorgeous? He was. He was a very, very beautiful tall, man. Tall fellow. I've... Tall. Very tall. Did you just look up? up? Did you want to climb him like a telephone pole? No, because he was in the wrestling stuff at the time. And it's like, you're all sweaty. I'll fall down. <laughs> <laughs> he seemed like a gentle giant. He was a very well. gentle giant. Super nice. All right, only a couple more left here, but, you know, trivia is always fun. Jem Susak's makeup took five hours to complete. One of the eyes, this is Sloth, one of the eyes, which was out of place on the face, was mechanically operated off screen by remote control, conceivably by Natalie Dormer. Someone would count down <laughs> and Matt Susak would blink his other eye in synchronization. The cast was told not to get him wet in scenes outside of the pirate ship. Unfortunately, he got wet. Delaying filming for another day. Because the eye went on the fritz. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, everybody was like, why is that creepy dude winking at me all day? Yeah, what's going on with that? I mean, he is hanging out with kids all the time. It's already creepy enough. Let's dial it down, people. Not as creepy as that luck dragon. Oh, don't get me started. Guys, go listen to the Never Ending Story episode. You'll learn things <laughs> that you never thought about. Do it. The bats were made of crumpled black pieces of crepe paper that were shot out of an air cannon. I always wondered how they actually got that nice burst to happen. So that's kind of cool that it was a t-shirt gun. <laughs> it's funny. It's funny. All right. Last one. According to director Richard Donner, in an interview with the directors, producer Steven Spielberg instructed the cast members to act cold and distant toward Donner on the last week of filming, which puzzled him. Because shortly after filming wrapped, Donner went to his beach house in Hawaii. He's got a beach house in Hawaii? Ran into a frenzied neighbor who took up his entire day. When he arrived home, the entire cast was there to celebrate with a cookout. Spielberg flew them over to Hawaii on the promise that they would not speak a word of the surprise to Donner, which prompted them to act the way they were on the last week of filming. I think Richard actually talks about that exact event. Uh, Josh Gad on his YouTube channel has been doing these uh, shows called Reunited Apart. It was great, and right? They did a, and they did a Goonies uh, Reunited and did some of the lines and shared some of the memories. And I think that was one of the conversations because I think Steven showed up and Donner was there and it was, it's just really cool to like watch that and like, man, that's my childhood. And they're going back and like, it, it, it just, it's just cool to see your heroes today. And that's why I think a short run movie would still work. Oh man. So I think that'd be fun. It would have been way better than crystal skull. <laughs> that's when we got to remake. We got to remake that whole movie. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Just that one, though. The rest of the indie flicks are, are perfectly fine. Okay, well, let's talk about the original. What makes the original for you so notable? Like, what do you love about it? 
what really stood out to you as to why it's so memorable and why people still love this movie 35 years later? I've got friends who can quote this movie all day. I'm sure you can as well. Why do you love it? I love it because it, this one in Back to the Future just did different things with movies where it had this like real slow, cold open where you're just walking down that jail cell. Like what, what is going on? I thought this was a kid's movie. Like what's happening here? And then you get the the whole trick with him hanging from the, the pipe wrench in the thing and you realize he's not dead. And then you get that just explosive music to start the movie. I think that was such a great way to introduce people to the fun and madness uh, that we were in for. And then to be introduced to every single character in the movie through the course of that chase scene, ending up at Mikey's house at the end. I think it's just an iconic way to start a movie and then just to, to just have like everything known up front, like what is all happening? It's a small town. It's, it's West coast. It's raining. It takes you through the They're, whole basic concept of the town, like where you are, like to that whole chase. Yeah. Yeah. The, the only, the only problem I think was that cause it was all underground. It kind of would have been fun to like see those locations come up as they were going around town trying to find the clues and follow the map before they got to the restaurant. So maybe it'd be, you go back to the docks where Stephanie's with the crabs and you go through the neighbor, like to the, the restaurant where Chunk was standing with his Pepsi shake or whatever that mm-hmm. splattered all over the window. And that, I think it would have been fun to see those locations happen throughout the movie. But yeah, just the opening is, is it just goes like, man, I'm excited to watch this. And then just the, the, the one liners and the stories and oh my gosh, Lawrence is so great, right? Chunk's character, uh, the way he's written and then the way he's acted, like, Everything about it is just it's just the funniest thing you've seen when you're when you're nine years old. Right. The the truffle shuffle, the whole like uh, this dude's a stiff and it's like <laughs> and this one time I climbed up in the balcony and I made a sound that went like this. <laughs> I was like, it's just like that's exactly what you would do as a kid. And it, it just it just brought back so many fun memories of just being a kid. So that when you watch it now as an adult, you're just man, like I want to hang out with my kids more and do the things that kids do again, like play kick the can and ghost in the neighborhood and all these other fun games that we used to play growing up. Cause we just, we lost a sense of fun over the way I think as adults. And it, I'm glad that this movie stands up over time because it's just, it's just fun. It, it's a mm-hmm. lot of fun. And it reminds all me all the way, all the way through. And, and I can't trust enough. Like it reminds me of camaraderie, a family of uh, just the friends you wanted, the, the brother you wanted, the sister you wanted. I mean, it just the girlfriend you wanted, like everything that you wanted at that age is in this movie. You wanted to have adventure and fun. The and family hang out with your units friends. that are like neighbors, right? Absolutely. Cause the neighborhoods yeah. was, the neighbors were always looking out for each other. So the data living right next door to Mikey, like you always had that buddy that lived, like I had, I had a, a set of twins that lived, across, unfortunately they were boys, but I had twins that lived across the street and um, and we were just we we're best friends, right? We would like do the whole flashlight tag through the window, and mm-hmm. we would try to build like uh, like the wire tin can telephone going across the busy road. That works, man. That that does work if you do it right. Yeah, but it's like it, it's those kind of memories that this movie just invokes, and and it's just it's it's just fun, and it's great, and it's so quotable. Well, because I will say, like, <laughs> especially this is where I feel bad for kids today, right? And I know, I know that makes me sound so old. I'm not that old, but. I get what you're saying, you know, but kids today are so stuck in their phone and technology that I don't know if they have the same kinds of friendships that we had as kids because we didn't have all of that. So we had to everything that we all the games we wanted to play and all the ideas we wanted to have. We had to come up with them. We had to find ways to actually use our imagination to play with our friends and do, you know, all the stuff that you guys can do on a phone now. You know, now you communicate through your phone. We didn't have that option. You had to sneak around and meet meet up at the playground and do all kinds of other things. It was just – and all of your friends were usually close by wherever you lived because it isn't like today. You know, we didn't have car. We weren't driving around. <clears throat> we, you met people wherever you congregated, which was usually your home and your neighborhood. So that those, Aaron, those friends – Aaron and I would not be friends because mm-hmm. we live an hour away from each other. True, true. And, and you know, I was – <laughs> there weren't there. I was a very, I don't want to say a minority, but there, I was the only white kid in my neighborhood. So, you know, I stood out. So it was hard to make friends at first, but eventually, you know, I ended up with, with some great friends and we had great time, but it was all like guys in the neighborhood. It was, it was wonderful. Like that's my childhood was wonderful, you know, had some issues. Absolutely. But this is the kind of stuff that reminds me of all the good times. This movie. Yeah. Now all we have is escape rooms. 
<laughs> that's like that's like the, the the level of our treasure hunting capability today as adults. And I do, you know, I I think the prison escape, while kind of ridiculous, is very fun, and it works. Like to, I mean, is is it plausible that he could get out that easily? I certainly hope not. Or we should probably look at how we. It's a small town jail. Sure. I think the bigger sure, issue is sure. Does the bullet actually light a ring of gasoline? That's the one I still want to get. It does not. By, you by know, Mythbusters. I think you know it doesn't. But I would also like to add, you know, one important thing in terms of how great this movie is, is the casting. Like this. It was perfect. There's few movies in the in the history of mankind where I would say, I wouldn't change anybody. This is one of them. This is one where I say, I wouldn't change anybody. There's there, nobody in this movie where I think they didn't do exactly what they were supposed to do and they did it to the best of their ability. Even Mama Fratelli, I mean, it's just, she's, you know, she's a great actress but she's also a great character and she really brings her to life. She pops and it works and you get why the boys love her. You know, you don't quite get why she changed her son up other than he's embarrassing a little bit, but all that stuff kind of works because of the actors that they cast. So it really is just like a perfectly come. It's perfect. It's a perfect movie. Yeah. Even Troy is an ass. Aaron can tell you it fits the bill perfectly. <laughs> True story. <laughs> Every Troy I know is like that. That's all I'm saying. Uh, some other, let me see. I'm going to hit you so hard when you wake up, your clothes are going to be out of style. I love that. I love how they, <laughs> they tie him up. I just think it's funny with this, this little weight thing. Um, the, uh, the wishing well scene I think is very heartwarming. It's just a kind of a beautiful scene for, for me. The ending where, where they find the treasure and Mikey doesn't get greedy and then all the goonies come together, I think is just beautiful to me as well. Like those are the, those are the highlights of the movie for me. Yeah, the whole um, not that one. Save that. Save that for Willie. Yep, Everything else. Exactly. And then exactly. that's something that turns out to be the booby trap that actually springs the ship free when the Fratellis end up taken from it anyway later. And and even Sloth coming to find a real family finally with the Goonies, I thought was was really sweet. Like I just thought that was that was really beautiful. Well, and, and Corey Feldman's at his best. I mean, when he's doing the whole translation with uh, Rosalita. Oh, he's kind of a racist, like, though. I mean, he th- threatens her with, with imprisonment at one point. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> but I mean, there was the whole like, you know, this is where he keeps the cocaine and this is where the porn is. And it's like, it's like, oh, my gosh, I moved into a murder house. And the statue. Oh, and the statue. You glued it out upside down. <laughs> <laughs> Be pissing so, your face if God intended it to be that way. That's so funny. <laughs> So anything doesn't work for you? Is there anything in this movie that actually does not work for you? I, I, I just watched it again in preparation for this, and I tried really hard to look at it with a critical eye to sit there and go, what is it that just doesn't stand the test of time or didn't work the first time around And we kind of looked at it with kids' eyes so you, you can see the faults now? The only thing that I think doesn't work for me is the pipe scene. Ah, that's on my list. It makes zero sense. It makes zero sense. It's funny as hell. And I love when Troy gets shot up at the toilet into the ceiling and then apparently still <laughs> conscious after he gets his head knocked out because, you know, we got to protect Troy's all over the world. I agree. Yeah. Put him in a camp. Yeah. That scene, like even when Sloth comes in later and he just shoves it up and then you hear the car crash. It's like, I'm almost glad they didn't show the car crash because it's like, I hate to see what actually happened. Like a fire hydrant blew up or something. Um but that entire pipe scene was the only thing that just didn't fit. And then an, uh, the only other thing I really came up with was the octopus. The octopus just didn't work when they added it into the special edition. And I almost was like, they should have just cut the octopus line out from the original movie, to be quite honest, for the special edition instead of making an octopus. But, it, you know, watch the regular version. You don't have to worry about it. Well, he does say octopus at the end still, though. And you're like, you're like, where's the octopus? Yeah, but you don't see it. <laughs> so I'm good with that. He could have just said, he just said the bats were really scary or the spikes were really scary. <laughs> like, where did octopus come from? <laughs> That's a trivia I want to know. Like, were they really trying to actually put an octopus in, in the original movie and they just couldn't get it to work and they had shot the scenes out of order? It's quite possible, right? It's quite possible. Yeah. What, the only thing that really bothered me is, is as I watched this, I watched it twice in the last month, honestly, they chained their son up in the basement of a restaurant and I still just think that's a weird ass story point. As much as I'm fine with it, I'm also like, what? That's just, I mean, they're evil, but that's really evil. Like, just yeah. really, really evil. But remember, Mama Fratelli, you know, as the kids leave the restaurant, she literally turns and looks at the camera and she's like, kids suck. 
So I get the feeling like she never really wanted kids to begin with. <laughs> and she's just kind of put up with her two kids that she has. And she really treats them like crap to begin with. And then, you know, Sloth is just the, the brunt of all of it because, you know, he's obviously disformed and disfigured and you get everything that you have going on today. You know, obviously this, that probably wouldn't fly in today's world. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think it speaks exactly to what the Fratelli characters are. And I think it really does set up the fact that here you have the, go- the, the definition of the Goonies is like overcoming all obstacles to stay together and mm-hmm. fight for what's right, mm-hmm. you know? And then here's Sloth, the guy changed to a basement left for basically nothing except for a plate of slop, you know, and a real annoying brother that sings Italian and he overcomes <laughs> and fi- he finds his family and he, and he saves the day and he breaks out and becomes super sloth and, you know, the whole knife pull down the sail and everything. I, I, the sloth story I think is what really makes the movie what it is. It's, it's truly the, the hero's journey that you look for when you tell one of these stories it's not Mikey. It's not Brant. It's not saving the goondocks. It's really Sloth. And then the the reason for Sloth to go through his journey is because of the goondocks and because of a story of country club and all that other stuff. But really, Sloth is the one that really means what is what it means to make, be a goonie. What the hell are you talking about? You could take Sloth out of this movie and I wouldn't care. Oh, no. I would like it more. <laughs> oh, I love Sloth and Chunk. Sloth and Chunk make the movie for me. Hey, you guys. Mama. You've been bad. <laughs> I just I oh, I love break. the actual Goonies, the actual kids. That's that's what I loved. I Sloth is hit or miss for me. I, the I actual kids them. were just lucky the whole time. That's just it, it was all just dumb luck to find. Hey, the, Dada was extremely smart. He had some pretty cool booby traps. Booby traps. Booby traps. He had some cool ones. Slick shoes. Slick shoes. <laughs> I like how mouth mouth's talent was just a jackass. Like that that's oh, yeah. his talent. Hey, Mickey, come over and give me a nice one. Take kiss. Ah. You could quote the movie all day long. <laughs> should this movie even be remade or should it be placed in don't touch status? Um, for me, I think this is one that you can't go back to the well on. So I would put it in the don't touch status. You could expand on the universe in different ways, but I don't think this particular movie, this particular story, I don't think you can touch it except for maybe redoing the pipes. I, I think you could do a sequel pretty easy. Um, oh, yeah. You know, sure. with, with their kids and stuff like that. Although I think that window has kind of passed. Spoiler alert for later. <laughs> well, I think you got some idea. Maybe it's their grandkids at this point. But uh, I could I could definitely, I could see something like that. And I, and I always like to ask this when something holds up. as What I would put it in don't touch status, I would, I would say. Uh, I would, when something holds up like this movie does, right? Why do you think people choose this film as a hand-me-down movie? Meaning meaning this is one that they show their kids who in turn show their kids. Like why this movie? Yeah, I'm trying to compare it, right? So it's like it's this one, it's Karate Kid, it's Back to the Future, it's Ghostbusters. Like it's there's like a staple mm-hmm. like selection like Raiders, these, Raiders of Lost Ark, Raiders ET, of Lost Ark, there's a couple ET, of those. Yeah. And I think it I think it just it's the it's the wonderment and amazement of something that's not possible becoming possible and knowing that no matter what, whether you're big, small, tall, strong, what have you, you could overcome the challenge and make that happen. And I think that's the same thing in every one of those movies, right? George McFly, he's just a weakling and then he comes up and beats up Biff at the end of the movie. Even Marty himself is a little bit of a downer at the start, you know, getting picked on. And I have no idea how he ever got Jennifer as a girlfriend, to be quite honest, originally in Definitely would have gotten her with the truck at the end of the movie. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, Elliot's picked on, you know, and then he finds this magical, mystical creature that makes him cooler than he probably is. And you know, he releases all the frogs. I mean, there's, it, it, I think that's what it is. It's the, it's the underdog becoming awesome because of something so fantastical that it just never would have happened in real life. And it's just the wonder and amazement when you sit back and watch it. Yeah, I, I think it's, to me, it's a movie that is, perfectly representative of its time but also holds up and like we talked about earlier and that's just a a very rare event you know there aren't many movies that really hold up ghostbusters mostly holds up but not to the level that i think goonies does because the special effects are very dated in ghostbusters for sure and the dogs look awful now trying to watch that is it was hard to watch it when it came out let alone now the story's still the story's still great story does jokes work you know all that sort of thing back to the future still holds up even with effects goonies still holds up 
because they don't have a lot of effects. Most of it's practical. And that pirate ship is amazing when you see it. You know, I, th- I really think, I don't even know if they could do it better now because they try to digitalize everything. It just wouldn't look as real. And, so. and a lot of those movies, and you could go check out a, a show called The Soundtrack Show uh, with David W. Collins. It's fantastic because he goes back and looks at all of these movies from this era and just how much the music is really the character of the story in a lot of these. And especially when you get to certain sequences like the cave sequence and there's the, like a, the Andes theme or the Goonies theme and when you hear these notes pop up in other places throughout the, the movie it's actually telling the story and you just don't even know it because it's so embedded in the background and then when you finally understand what that's actually meant to be like uh, the Dies Irae Dies Irae there's like these four notes and it's basically from like a Gregorian chant mass and it's like so when you actually see those notes at the uh, pipe organ and she plays the wrong ones it's actually the Dies Irae notes um, so you know that death is imminent, basically, is what it means. Ah, that's a fun fact. Yeah, the score by David Gru- by Dave Grusin. Very, gr- yeah. it's a great score. It's a, it's very fun, very lively, very ominous in moments. I mean, I think they did a, a wonderful job. And one- I was wondered if I wonder if, if uh, David was actually a writer too on this because no. only a musician, mm-hmm. only a musician comes up with the is it A sharp or is it B flat? Well, uh, play the wrong note, we'll all be flat. <laughs> Maybe, but Chris Columbus wrote this, and he he is a gifted writer. So it's because very you possible. know that A sharp and B flat is the same note. I did not know that. Yeah, there is no such thing as A sharp technically. Most times when you see it, it's a B flat, but a half step up from A is a B flat, and a half step down from B is a B flat. So it is literally the same note. That's why I thought it was it was only a musician writes a joke like that. Hmm. Well, Chris Columbus wrote it. Maybe he we've got some info from him. I don't know how that works. Maybe. But the story was Steven Spielberg, and it was the, st- the movie was written by Chris Columbus, who went on to Home Alone and a bazillion other things. Harry Potter. He did a re- yep. the first two Harry Potter movies. Okay, we've got one more clip from The Goonies. Wait a minute! Wait a minute! This isn't gold. This is a wishing well. Look. Hey, you guys, look. look. It must be the old Moss Garden wishing well. You know, I always used to believe that when you threw your money in, it turned into your wish. You take no coins. And I'll take two coins. No, no, that's not fair. Wait, 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 wait. Stop, stop. You can't do this. Why? Why? Because these are somebody else's wishes. They're somebody else's dreams. Yeah. But you know what? This one. This one right here. This was my dream, my wish. And it didn't come true. So I'm taking it back. I'm taking them all back. All right, since this movie is hitting its 35th anniversary, and as fans, we always think we know the best way to do anything, how should Hollywood remake The Goonies? Now, remember, our selections are settled by typically a best of three vote, but our third host couldn't make it for this one. So we'll just, we'll fight. We'll cage match it out. We'll, we'll get there. Each host gets a cut one cut per episode to be used when they are extremely passionate about their idea now you can't cut an entire idea out just an element of it so first we, we rattle off our idea who who do you want to go first me or you you choose um you go first this time okay here we go i have, I have a really i have a really good idea so i'm curious to hear how yours because because i have like a really good opening and a really good ending that ties together and i need help with the middle so i'm hoping your middle can flush out my idea all right i'm ready are you ready i'm ready here we go See, this one is a bit easier to me than the other ones because I I wouldn't change too much, honestly. So no no Cop pirates. Out. He didn't do he didn't do his work. <laughs> no, I did a ton of work. <laughs> no pirates this time though. I, I would use reality. No pirates. So in nineteen 19- pirates are real. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. Space pirates might not be real, but pirates are real. <laughs> you know what? I don't even want to tell you my idea anymore. We're done. All okay, right, here's, I'll here's go, I'll go, I'll go I'm, I'm in more modern it. reality, okay? I'm more mo- I would use a more modern reality. Got it. That's modern pirates with speedboats, James Bond style. <laughs> Got it, okay. In 1988, New Mexico antiques dealer Forrest Fenn was diagnosed with terminal cancer. This is true. He decided to be buried with $2 million of gold, gems, and jewelry in an undisclosed location in the western U.S. He actually recovered, but decided to bury it anyway and create a treasure hunt. This is all true. Go look it up. He wrote a poem with nine clues and created a treasure map that anyone can find in his autobiography, The Thrill of the Chase. So if you're feeling like a treasure hunt of your own, go find that book and, and see you can join in. So people have died looking for this treasure. And I want our Goonies to be the ones that finally find it. So my movie is set in Denver, Colorado, very scenic area, 
perfect for a treasure hunt. Don't have to worry about Portland, <laughs> but also has an inner city. So seven inner city kids, see, I come from the inner city, so I like that idea, are again in danger of losing their homes due to a city zoning project. And I want a mix of races and sexes, like a real inner city. I want Mikey, his older brother, Brand, Chunk, Mouth, Steph, Dada, and Andy, but of all uh, variants of, of races. The only way to save their homes are to pay the assessment taxes and reclaim their rights. Their parents will never have this kind of money. They just won't. So Mikey, our leader, just like in the, in the original, tells them about the thrill of the chase, the book. No one believes him, just like you guys listening probably don't, but it's real. Swear to God, Google it. But since they've got nothing to lose and his older brother, Bran, does have a driver's license in this one, because you're going to need it to drive around, they, <laughs> they set off to find the treasure. Now, one of the kids' dad is a low-life criminal. I'm going to go with Mouth. Makes sense. Here's their plan, assembles his brother and mother for Telly to follow them to the treasure and steal it for themselves. I leave out Sloth because I don't think it would work today. I just think, I just don't. Along the way, one of the kids gets kidnapped. I'm saying data so that he can escape on his own at some point, not have to be saved. And they have to find the treasure to save them all. That's my Goonies. Sounds a little bit like Game Night in a way. Uh, Not even a little. Nope. I don't even know what the hell you're, it's not even close to Game Night, but. You know, if you got to pull from a movie of recent history, go for it. <laughs> um, actually, part of that actually is going to fit really well with my idea. Okay. So, painting a picture, scene opens. We find ourselves back in Astoria, Oregon as the credits roll, and we see the locations we saw in the opening of the original Goonies, but over some more nostalgic, lighthearted type of music. We see, like, Stephanie's Crab Barrel. We see the house where... Mouth and his dad were fixing the water plumber. We see the restaurant where Chunk was in the window, et cetera, et cetera. And that's all over the opening credits. And we just kind of familiarize ourselves with the goondocks once again, ending up with um, Data and Mikey's house before we pan away to the Astoria Country Club. As we pan through a restaurant sitting, two men are seen at a table eating and discussing the current financial health of the country club. Through conversation, we learn that the club is in foreclosure and a wealthy developer is looking to tear the club down to build a new tech center for business and commerce, almost a self-contained city within a city. One of the people at the table is actually Troy, uh, the jock sports car driving asshole and current owner of the club after his father had passed away. Ah. Across town, a funeral is taking place and we can't see who's at the funeral, but as the camera pans in, we finally hear the name Walsh said out loud. And we realize that Mikey is there attending his dad's funeral. Mom had died years ago, and the funeral director hands Mikey an envelope that says, One Last Goonie Adventure, and a set of keys. Mikey then takes the keys to the historical society now inherited from his father. He sets the envelope on the desk as Troy happens to walk in. Troy, hearing about what happened, pays Mikey a visit, asks why Brant wasn't at the funeral, and we get a line that basically, like, you know, he was on a plane, the plane got grounded. Mikey had to take a train, or Brandt had to take a train across the country, so hey, he's hey, going to hey, be a, hey. a couple days late. It's Brand, you goonie. All right? Whatever. Brand. <laughs> Brand. So he's basically on a train coming from Chicago, so he's going to be late for the funeral, so that's why he's not there. Hmm. Right? Uh, Troy then basically tells Mikey what's happening with the country club. Through the conversation, Mikey remembers something about the land that the country club was originally built on, and some big argument about the sale of the land originally, and when he finds a book something actually falls out of the book and it's an old document from the gold rush era about a secret gold mine thought to be in Astoria. They can't read it because it's in Spanish. So they go to the high school where they run into local Spanish teacher who is mouth uh, replayed by Corey Feldman and Troy and Mikey played by their original actors have kids that are at the school that also happen to be in mouse class. They basically translate the information and now the five of them, Mikey, Troy, mouth, and Mikey's kid and Troy's kid now start their amazing journey as they are trying to find this mine and save the country club. So you you would they do get, like parents, the Goonies, original Goonies with their kids. Yeah, kind of like the Bill and Ted face the music kind of angle, if you will. Does that mean Keanu Reeves shows up? I'm confused. Is like John Wick in this? Well, he could be one of the bad guys, right? Because then all of a sudden there's a bunch of bad guys who are basically thwarting their every move to try to stop them from finding the gold mine. And then you get to the the end where you actually find the gold mine. And when they show up there, the big bad actually shows up. And it's the same guy that was at the restaurant at the very beginning of the movie. It turns out that he is Chester Copperpot's grandson. 
who knew about the mine the whole time from his family history, and he wanted to buy the land not because of the tech center, but because he felt the Goonies screwed his family over by finding the One-Eyed Willie treasure originally. And so he was going to buy the club, use the money from the mine, and then destroy the Goondocks forever because every great villain has that awesome speech right before you get hit in the head by a two-by-four because Brand shows up with Martha Plimpton, and they're like, oh my gosh, Like they saved the day. And how did they get there? Well, it turns out when Brand finally shows up at the Historical Society, he found the envelope that said One Last Goonie Adventure, which had told Mikey about the mine, and Martha Plimpton's Stephanie happened to be on the train going to Seattle from Chicago, so she ran into Brand on the train, and that's how we get to bring them back in the movie. Uh, then what the club saved and the goondock saved, the seven of them now have a dinner at the country club. Uh, they basically were talking about the, what happened on the train and all the adventures and everything. And then just as they leave the country club, they go back to the cemetery where inside of the envelope was a small piece of gold that's literally in the shape of a triangle. And Mikey places the gold inside the letter A of Walsh on the tombstone and you cut to black. Hmm. 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 So how do we combine the two? Do, 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 do. Do, 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 well, I like the clues around town because if you go back to like, I always wanted to see the town locations. I think we could use your framework and just use the treasure hunt. The treasure hunt. Yeah. Yeah. I think we could totally that would make that movie happen because I, I would be okay with that because honestly, that, I think that's a movie most fans would want to see rather than a full remake, you know, but I, but I would like some other because it's a lot of white people. <laughs> oh, for sure. So, so Mikey they, could adopt. Mikey yeah, could adopt. No, the adopt kid. He married. He married a black woman. He married. A giant, you know, everybody. Everybody. Everybody shakes it up nowadays. Married a Hispanic. Yeah, mixed, whatever. Mixed families. Sure. Sure. As long as we get that. I just want some reality here, and I think that would be uh, fun. not that I'm against anything. Don't don't write a letter, but I think that would make it uh, more versatile. Goonies. Goonies for yeah, modern just, day. My big thing was like it was like oh it's Chester Copperpot's grandson that's where it started and then I kind of worked from there I thought that was kind of a cool twist. Now you didn't have sloth anywhere near your in yours either. No, because he we don't know if he ended up living or dying after the. Did we? Did he? Did, I can't remember. Did he survive at the end of the movie? Yes, he survived. He was fine. Oh yeah, that's right. They did come out at the end in the sunset, and then they saw the pirate ship. He could show up yeah, with yeah, Bran yeah. at the end. You know, he could. it's like he he helps he helps them save the day. He runs off yeah. and gets Bran, or goes runs off and gets sloth. That's why he's not there for a big portion. Yeah. Something like that. I think that could work. Yeah. Sure. All right. Yeah. Well, boom. That was pretty easy. We should just make this and be done with it. So, director, who should make the the movie? Like, who do you want to direct it? Oh, so that's the hard part. Not for me. I, I, I didn't even think about it. Christopher Columbus. You know, he wrote the original. He loves, especially if you're going to have him involved with having the, the same characters and their kids. I think you want a guy who understands these movies. And he's made a lot of fun movies. So I, I really think Chris Columbus is the guy to go with. What did he direct re recently? Home Alone, Harry Potter, one. Oh, he actually directed? I thought he wrote them. No, he I directed. Think. He directed them. He directed okay. those. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm down with that. For shizzle. <laughs> Definitely. For shizzle. And he's also, you know, he's a proficient professor. Uh, I mean, he's had a couple of misses. He did Pixels. I don't know what he felt about Pixels, but but he's also, I think he's a fun director. I think this is something that he loves and he would do very well with. I think we should call him. Yeah. Give him the idea. We'll get on it. So now based on the, on the remake, you know, you're going to have the same older cast, obviously, but they're, they're varied in ages. You know, all my characters are based on the people that I have. So basically, let's just say with their kids, we don't have to name them. Um, but who would you want cast as the younger generation? Well, see, I was going to say Samara Weaving could play a high school student, but because she's in Bill and Ted now, I feel like I have to cast somebody else. Why? She's fantastic. Yeah, but she's also kind of on the, uh, she plays a little bit older now. I don't know if she could pass for a high school senior. Okay. Amanda Steinberg. I've seen a Bill and Ted. It's like she feels more college. Amanda Steinberg. She is great. I love her. Yeah. To death. I don't know if you saw The Hate You Give, but she's fantastic. For sure. And the Hunger Games. She was in the Hunger Games too. Uh, like Sabrina Carpenter came to mind. I just watched uh, Work It on. Is it Work It on Netflix? Mm -hmm. Basically, the Bring It On but dance version. And uh, surprisingly, she was actually really entertaining. I enjoyed her character a lot in that movie. I would like Chloe Coleman in here. She was in My Spy. I don't know if you saw that, but she's fantastic. She could be like a mouth mouth's daughter because mm -hmm. <laughs> she's she's mouthy. 
oh, we could have Journey Smollett be like a, one of the bad guys, but it's a bad female. I think she could play a good villain as part of the part of the villain group. I could see that. That'd be fun. I'm trying to think who else. Young actors are hard. McKenna Grace, I would like to see in here somewhere. She's just very talented. Um, she's in the Haunting of Hill House. She's very talented. You could always throw in a Jacob, Jacob Tremblay or uh, Abraham Atta from Beast of the Nation. There's a lot of little, a little, little actors, a lot of young, young actors that I think could fill some roles. It's really hard to find them because I really kind of like it. You know what I mean? A lot of the mm-hmm. kids you would put in these roles, you probably don't know who they would be. You know, a lot of right. them are newcomers. You know, I mean, Finn Wolfhard, you can put in everything. But aside from that. Well, he has been. Greg is in the Ghostbusters as well. Yeah. He's literally in yeah. everything where there's a young person. Or the 80s remake. <laughs> <laughs> so probably Finn has to be in here somewhere too, I guess. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Just put him in the back like he's uh, he's driving him around something. Okay. Well, in terms of nostalgic moments, these are either subtle or direct nods to the original that our remake needs. What What needs to be in here for a throwback for you? I think the wishing well scene definitely has to be in there somehow. Like they come across another wishing well or a fountain or something where they... Or something, yeah, where they can have some kind of spiritual uplifting moment. Be a nice moment with their kids where they explained yeah. why they... What happened when they were young. I, I think oh, you I, need to have... You don't want a pirate ship, obviously, because... No. It, but you could have where a pirate ship is prominent in a scene or something. You know, like they're in a museum or something along those lines. It's one of the clues... Leads them to a museum. Yeah. And I, and, I, and I think you need uh, the booby traps. You need Data's, Data's contraptions. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And a statue of a guy's dick upside down. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great while they're in the same museum next to the pirate ship. They've all got a statue and it's <laughs> upside down. That would be totally. fantastic. Totally. Oh, uh, that's pretty funny. And also um, Mouth, because he's an adult, right? Or Chunk. Yep. I'm sorry. Chunk is an adult. You got to have him in fantastic shape just like the uh, the real chunk cohen yeah. you know he got in great shape and he's no longer beefy i mean he's in he's in good shape i think that could would even be work him could even work his like real job into the, the movie like he's a lawyer and they have to do some kind of like legal exploration at perfect. library in order to find a clue perfect love it there we go we get the whole cast back together we've got one more clip from the goonies here you go don't you realize the next time you see sky it'll be over another town The next time you take a test, it'll be in some other school. Our parents, they want the best of stuff for us. But right now they gotta do what's right for them. Cause it's their time. Their time. Up there. Down here, it's our time. It's our time down here. That's all over the second we ride up Troy's bucket. All right, all that to get to this. This is our trailer for our new 2021-ish, maybe 2022 version of The Goonies, presented to you by the Hollywood Outsider and Wayne Henderson of MediaVoiceOvers.com. Take it away, Wayne, you Goonie. The Astoria Country Club is in danger of foreclosure, and a more mature former foe now needs help from the only team who've ever managed to get things done to save it, the Goonies. Many years earlier, rich entrepreneur Forrest Fenn hid $2 million in golden jewels somewhere in the vast Oregon wild. If this treasure can be discovered before the villainous Chester Copplepot IV gets there, an Astoria landmark can be saved. The Goonies have the tools, but since the years have finally caught up to them, they're going to need help from a new generation. That's right, their kids. The original cast returns to join 80s nostalgia with modern technology and a who's who of young actors for a movie over 35 years in the making. It's our time right there. The clues are everywhere. The danger is real. And the adventure has just begun. These are the Goonies. And they never say die.
Bam! Yes, that was amazing. I will. Watch I can't that. believe that he can put that together so fast. I know. It's just like, w- were you listening the whole time, Wayne? What the hell is going on? Hopefully, there's not time travel in this movie. That would be weird. <laughs> <laughs> I would like time travel. That would be cool. Why not? You, Marty McFly just drives up with his DeLorean at the end. You're not gonna believe what happened. Wait, that's the wrong character. Sorry. <laughs> That's Doc. <laughs> what happened? I don't know what I'm doing. Oh, man. Anything more you want to say about uh, the Goonies before we head on out of this bad boy? If you're listening to this and you've never seen the movie, go see the movie. You made it a really long f- way if you've never seen it to get, to get to where we already plotted the remake and everything else. Well, and they're probably thinking like, where the bats come in and where does the pipes come in and what pirate ship? Like, I want to go see this thing. This sounds awesome. (laughs) And why is this little brother making out with her? And she doesn't even open her eyes once to see. See, this is why you always open your eyes at some point, people. Just to be sure. You you have to remember it's dark in the cave. The only reason there were lights in there was so that the audience could see what was going on. (laughs) But for the characters, they pretty much were in the dark. Mm Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm going to try that uh, and uh, see if I don't get charged, basically, is what, is what I'm <laughs> guessing. I think if I tried that in a cave, I'd be charged. Be careful. There is a hole somewhere around here. <laughs> I think Brand was stepping in it. Oh, it was uh, such a cute scene. Such a cute scene. This is the, this is the men's room. <laughs> Wayne Henderson, thank you again for doing that. MediaVoiceOvers.com. I know he loves doing that stuff. Troy, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me over at the blacklist exposed.com with this other joker uh, doing all things through the blacklist, which hopefully will return sometime soon, maybe yet this year, worst case 2021 for its eighth and cross your fingers, potentially <laughs> final season. <laughs> and you can find me on the Hollywood outsider at all times, the Hollywood outsider.com. You can also find remake this movie, right? At remake this movie, right.com or the Hollywood outsiders at the same website, actually. And I show up on there too occasionally. You do. Absolutely. Troy shows up there too. And we've got 60 some other remake episodes you can listen to. And if you are a fan of this and you want more or you want us to look at maybe bringing it back someday, remake this movie right at gmail.com. We should plug uh, remake this movie right. The Stand. It was just announced that CBS is going to be airing The Stand. CBS All Access will be doing The Stand as a four part miniseries uh, later this year in December. So if you're a fan of The Stand, go find the Remake This Movie Right Stand episode so you can find out how we didn't get any royalties for our idea. I just want to clarify. So basically you plug the one episode of the entire Remake series that I'm not on. I plugged the Never Any Story earlier. Okay. I'm not on that right. one. Yeah, I'm just saying on the way out the door, you're like, what's the one that Aaron wasn't part of? The Stand. M-O-O-N. Uh, if if this is the first time you found this podcast, we've actually had uh, some real fun too with some other '80s properties, especially Short Circuit, where the gentleman SS Wilson, Steve Wilson, he was actually the guy that wrote Short Circuit, and he came on to remake his own movie. Yeah, that with was us, fun. that was so. That fun. was a great episode. Great episode. He did the Howling with us too, right? I think. And yes. the Magnificent Seven. He did yes, two of them. <laughs> he was great, man. I love him. He is a good time. He's a good time. Maybe we'll do it again. You know, everything's going to have an anniversary over the next couple of years. So you never know. And you never know. Troy really wanted, he had an idea to do this once a month. So if you guys really love it, you let me know and we'll, we'll look at it. But there's got to be love there. There's got to be love. Okay. Well, the credits have rolled in this remake, but be sure to come back for our next one. Remember that every film you love will get a reboot someday. And you know what? It's been a while, but that proves true because there's a remake announced every freaking week. Just remember that only you can remake this movie right. You goody! That was my eardrum. You're welcome. You goody! Is that how you say it? Yep. Okay. Andy! <laughs> you goody! 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 You spread the batter around. I wonder if they got in a fist fight once he found out you made out with his girlfriend. Sloth. Chocolate. Chocolate. We, sh- we didn't even cast Natalie Dormer. That's okay. I only think a small select people get that joke. That's such an in-joke. I don't even care. <laughs>